counter on your side of the fence. You gotta tell your boy to watch the bass in his voice when he speaks to me. When I was in high school, my voice was super high. It was like, hello! And so when I would leave voice messages, you would get this super energetic kid. Just, I don't, I don't, I don't, I've seen the pictures of you. Play Halo and da, 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 it makes sense. Pepper. Obnoxious. <laughs> We've gotten to know the sort of bunkhouse OGs from the beginning, but it's so exciting to me to see Clint and Wade introduced this season. You got permission to run them things here? No, I just decided today I'd run some buffalo across the field for no reason. Boots Sutherland. Boy, is he a character. Mm. Are you, you know how much of a character this dude is? Yeah. When he was coming on, Ori was like, I'm not gonna do his voice, but he was like, hey, there's a dude coming on set to play this guy, and he is. Dude, he is a character. I know him from way back. If you're saying it, then this guy must be like, yeah. he makes Forey look like a kid. We meet them on the fence line. We do, yeah. At least some of here. You meet bad guys and guys in the bar that we're gonna beat up, we know they're not cool. These guys just have a different tone about them. Because you, you don't know definitively how far they're willing to go. Yeah, they're really the dark. I blow your for brains all over this field. Yeah, send, send Colby and Ryan out and chase off those two alligators. <laughs> and we go, what do I like, pull out my badge or do something mm -hmm. like, Livestock Association! Here's my badge, care about it. Scram, get out of here. I need proof that those are brucellosis free. It didn't go over so well. If you're mad enough, come and get it. And, and I think it was Rip who came to the rescue. Keep your cat on your side of the fence. You gotta tell your boy to watch the bass in his voice when he speaks to me. I sort of keep my voice up here most of the time. <laughs> and then when I'm around Cole Hauser, I try to kind of drop it down to sort of legitimize myself in his eyes. So back up here with you guys, hey, I feel comfortable, I'm at home, I can really be myself. This is what my voice really sounds like. But as soon as I'm acting with Cole, it's like, hey, Rip. You with the Yellowstone? What's up, Park? So that would be adding or increasing bass level, yeah, which adding he more does, bass. it sounds like he doesn't like that. Well, you definitely don't want to talk lower than him. You know? Yeah. Well, and I couldn't if I tried. Physiologically, I'm not capable. He's not capable of doing it. It's a, how low it's can a you go? chest cavity. Thing. You're, you're trained vocally. How much yeah. your low note? Give me a. Uh, give me a. Oh, dude, probably, see that? This, this is probably the lowest. That's like that. It's not even in the audible spectrum. I can't even yeah. hear that. This is what I sound like when I wake up in the morning. Dog whistle. Yeah. So that's the low. So I don't think that. That's why when I engage with Rib, I don't even try to go down that path because I think I would be on the train very quickly. <laughs> Sup. 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 Hey! Sup. Sup. Uh, up. What's up? Uh, <laughs> Hey there, Rip. I think with Rip, you know, he wants to feel like he's always respected. We all know that there's a pecking order to anything that you do, and, you know, he's the, the top of the pecking order. You better hope I never see you again. I mean, all the that Cole Hauser does, I can do better than him, but you learn over time to pay him the respect yeah, of sort of pretending he deserves, you Yeah, can. he deserves to at least feel you know he's, in the, he's better. He's in the building. Right? He's in the which building? The This one. The building that we're in now? Let me just... Have you figured out how to do this without all us getting trampled? Let's get up there as fast as we can and just chase them some down a mountain. I think after three seasons of riding, that's a moment where you, you are even like, well, this is pretty phenomenal. I don't think it's been captured on film that many horses being, being run. At all. Uh, in that kind of scape. I mean, that's like some. I mean, you had hundreds of acres of just wide open space and these beautiful horses. People, people are gonna think maybe that we fudged it somehow. Of course, uh, but we didn't no, at all. No, like didn't. there's, all of those horses are real. We're doing all of the riding. Mm -hmm. And an element that we are not even familiar with because it's not like we're pushing cattle. You know, like I've never pushed horses before. Mm. The landscape and the beauty of it all. And it's just, you know, again, you, it's something that you read and you're like, how are we gonna do this? You know what I mean? And as an artist, you're just kind of like, okay, there'll be a green screen, it'll do this or something. But you're like, no, 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 what he wrote is what we're gonna do. And that's pretty fascinating. You know, I got half a mind to run up that hill and do it again. What did you all think it was going to be like? 
coming into this world. Obviously, at that point, you know, going into you know third season, which I think on any show is difficult because things have already happened. You know, and now you're just coming into this brand new environment. Please, Eden Road. Well, <laughs> I was a fan of the show, <laughs> which is really exciting because I I got to go on to these sets that I had been like only seeing on TV and being like, oh my God, <laughs> it's the Yellowstone barn with the big Yellowstone sign and like going into the bunkhouse for the first time, walking in and being like, oh, I'm here. <laughs> I'm in the bunkhouse. What was your audition so, process like? I put myself on tape, and then I was in Ireland, got the job, and came on home. Just Earth. like that? Yeah. Just like that. <laughs> he was like, wow, really cool. I auditioned for Teeter, uh, and then like six months later or something, uh, Mia, Mia came in, and easy as that, you know? Teeter's has a sort of really exciting, budding love interest with Colby. You on back row? Don't. Yes. Would you say that you were profoundly disappointed when you found out that you were going to have a sort of budding <laughs> love interest with Jimmy? Would you characterize your experience of that as profound disappointment? It was profound. <laughs> cool. She'll just leave it at profound. That was kind of easy. <laughs> no, it's like, it ain't supposed to be hard. <laughs> I love what we do in the bunkhouse, but yeah. to have this new dynamic coming in and the way you guys just sort of Tasmanian devil through and take over, what were your thoughts coming in about how you were going to disrupt the masculine energy in there and do your thing. The guys are gonna be back in a minute. If they catch you drinking their beer, they're gonna, woo! I think more than anything, it's just honoring whatever Sheridan writes to the pages. The juxtaposition of our kind of like wild, carefree, irreverent energy with how, you know, like serious and, and dropped in you guys are and, and, and kind of what a, <laughs> what an operation you guys yeah. have going. I mean, it makes for a really interesting dynamic, you know? We helped ourselves to your beer, hope you don't mind. Yeah, we can see. I feel like there's an implied culture behind being barrel racer, which is more important than just riding the horse around. For people that don't know, why are barrel racer girls such a thing that we point out? I'm a barrel racer, so bad judgment's just part of the package. People that are familiar with the rodeo world and that whole circuit, like the barrel racers, uh, they kind of have their own, well, they're kind of like rock stars, you know? They tour around the country, they live out of these trailers, they, you know, sleep in motels. They're just like trying to have a laugh and a good time wherever they can. And or uh, bunk houses. Or bunk houses. And Hot bunking, bunk one might even say. Hot bunking. Laramie. <laughs> just kidding. I, Hot make, I make no apologies. Are you too old to dance? Ain't a damn thing I'm too old to do. <laughs> Was there anything from like your everyday you that you were able to bring? to that, or is Foul it just language. something that was completely uh, Laramie's different. a real stretch, you know? Yeah. <laughs> she has a hard time with men. She doesn't really, uh... <laughs> no, I mean, I think I think it's great. I grew up in Texas. I spent a lot of time on a ranch, and I, I grew up around a lot of cowboys. So I have um, an a easy time relating. It's a fun place to play in. What would you say would be like a highlight of you know, season three, and like, what are you looking forward to the most in seeing? I think like one of the highlights for me was was like day one mm. because I didn't. It wasn't everybody. Yeah. It was like Jeff, mm. Jake. That day went like so swimmingly. It was so nice to have you around. It was so nice that all the flag stuff and the rodeo stuff worked. I had like the nervous jitters of the century and we got to have a really, that was a really good day. You are Jimmy Herdstrom. I remember you talking about you were being nervous to ride, but then you rode so incredibly. <laughs> You were amazing with the flag and everything. That's like some very difficult. Well, I remember too, because they were trying to get that light. Yeah. And so they were like, get on the horse and ride around. Yeah. Here's your flag. And I was like, okay, I've never done this before. And then they were like, we got to get this shot. All right, day one, I'm like, let's go Yellowstone. Let's do it. All right, let's get mystery out of the way right up front. Uh -huh. One of the first things that she all have is that hospital scene. How's your pecker? Did they pitch you on that? Like, so by the way, you get here's to see where Jeff's we're going. naked butt. Was the only reason why you said yes because you could see his naked butt? That's it. <laughs> that was it. All right, we're good here. That's we also why most of the cast said yeah. yes to their yeah. roles. I did get a call from Taylor, I think, if I'm remembering this right, saying, You have a pretty naughty scene. You're not a virgin, are you? What? Are you okay with that? 
And I said, sure, I got to be on Yellowstone. Of course I'm okay with it. Take my pants off for some Yellowstone. <laughs> How many Wranglers does Yellowstone have? 10 or 11. What do you think about the bunkhouse? What kind of happens and how that changes when Rip comes into the bunkhouse. Working with Cole for the first time, like he really is, as, again, like ha having just watched the show and having not much context for him except for like Rip, it's a little bit scary. What the f And then you get to know him and he's wonderful. And he comes in like he often does, you know, bowl in the <laughs> china shop and everything stops until he sees her and like everything changes. We all see that moment when right. he sees Beth. I yeah. think everybody goes, oh, that's sweet. You yeah. know, he's got a little thing and he's, he's not this like scary dude anymore. I should have known it was you. You want to talk? Not this one. A lot to say. I'm just going to start us off about finally revealing the reason why Beth is hates Jamie with so much passion. And I think they, the hardest part for Taylor in that was to pick something that, that you could understand the level uh, of, of vitriol that she has, but also that he wouldn't be killed by John Dutton. So you ha it was such a fine line. What could you do that would match those that, that satisfies the audience on both sides? I think as, as fans of the show, and as someone who's sort of been fascinated with the relationship between Jamie and Beth for three years now, as the anger and tension between them escalated, as Beth was stabbing Jamie underneath the table, I remember over and over again us having these conversations and being like, this is crazy. Yeah. Like, how, how, what could it possibly be yeah. that would justify this level of vitriol that Beth feels towards Jamie that she's constantly antagonizing him? I could use some advice. Oh, my God. You're pregnant. And then when we finally read that script, and like, not to say that we could ever understand that pain, but all of a sudden it all just kind of clicked. It, it humanizes Beth, and Taylor doesn't write any one-dimensional characters, right. but it's easy to write Beth off as, as an archetype, as, you know, she's the angry one. And also through her relationship with Rip, you see her painted in so many shades, yeah. and like what Kelly Riley has been doing since episode one of the show, Going back and watching from the beginning with that context, Kelly Riley's performance is so layered. She's an incredible actor. And then everything that you felt about Jamie just changed. Someone will love you, and you'll love somebody. And I can't wait to take that from you. From the beginning, you kind of felt like, dang, like, you know, she's just mad because, you know, he's like a lawyer and he does this and he's not as strong as, you know, all of these other men that are in the family are, so you kind of felt bad for him. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, when you find out this other information, you're like, oh, like, there's a whole other side to you, you know, that you've also been running from as well and also, like, not acknowledging and so much of the arguments and the frustrations, the time too, where they're sitting in the car together and they're driving, having conversations. If hating me keeps you from hating yourself, I'll be there for you, Beth. You want to go back and revisit these moments. This is what they were both fighting against and fighting for. One is like the needing to have the acknowledgement and the other one is doing everything that they can to not acknowledge it. The family. I love how people think that word entitles them to absolution from the people whose lives they ruin. It's very personal. All of a sudden, you feel like very much like, wow, I feel very involved. And you can see that he's also laboring under the shame and the guilt yeah. of that trauma that they both mm -hmm. experienced as kids. Yeah. Like Jamie was a kid when he made right. that terrible decision. And he thought he was doing what was best for her at the time, you know, and to like also protect the family and protect the brand. And I think that's where you, there's always that walk in the fine line of like how much do you protect the family, how much do you protect the brand at the, you know, at the downfall of other people that are around you.